Hi, I'm Lily, and this is the Service Design Show, episode 201. Hey there, welcome. On this show, we connect with the brightest minds in our field to uncover what's truly needed to design great services that resonate with people, drive businesses forward, and honor our planet. And if you care about that last part, you'll love today's conversation. Because our guest today argues that we're facing a crisis of connection to ourselves, nature, and to each other. Current sustainability efforts are mere tweaks, not the transformative change we need. Despite the fact that we've known about climate change for decades, we've done very little about it. But even in this crisis, there's an opportunity, an opportunity to rebuild, not what just was, but to create something truly new and better. Lily Graf is on a remarkable journey. She's gone from working at top design agencies to founding and leading a network of people who are committed to driving positive climate and social change. The leap from a stable job to running her own business wasn't easy. It meant embracing the unknown and adapting constantly. She believes that the same bold, uncomfortable approach is the key to tackling climate change. So in our conversation today, you'll discover what inspired Lily's bold move to independence and the personal growth it required. The challenges of breaking free from the daily grind and building a business out in the open and how she found her unique place within the sustainability movement and strategies for creating safe spaces to process the difficult reality of our changing future. And finally, what gives her hope that climate adaptation will become more widespread. We cover a lot of ground in this episode, but I especially encourage you to pay close attention to the part where we talk about how Lily's experiences growing up in the mountains shaped her perspective and drive why starting your own business can be one of the best ways to develop the resilience and adaptability needed to thrive in uncertain times so let's dive into this conversation and i'll catch you back at the end with some final thoughts my name is mark fontein and this is the service design show welcome to the show lily Thanks, Mark, for having me. I'm excited to talk about an important topic, a topic that's being addressed more often on the show, which I'm really happy about. But before we dive in, as always, we do a quick introduction uh, to learn a little bit more about who you are and what you do. Let's start with uh, what's on your LinkedIn profile these days? What do you do? The <laughs> what do you, how do you describe what you do these days? So I describe myself as one, being a strategic designer that focuses on climate resilience. And two, I'm also the founder of IMA Collective. So I'm essentially putting to practice what I preach with my clients so that I actually have some concrete, you know, concrete examples and um, of how things could be done in the future. Uh, probably at the end of our chat, I'll ask you what's the next thing that you'll be adding to your LinkedIn profile. But uh, yeah, that's, that's yeah. for the end. The, the other question that I always have is, I'm really curious if you recall the moment that you first heard about service design. So I think the first thing where I thought or experienced service design was actually visiting Singapore. And it was a city where I felt I was walking through and every time I had a question, I actually found the answer if I just looked for it. And then I... I was working as an innovation project manager on European funded projects, and we were building a lot of platforms. And after three years, quite a few of them kind of didn't really work. And I was like, ah, well, what could we do to make this better? And somehow, I can't remember, I discovered design or a book like by Tim Brown, a design change by design. And, and I was like, ah, this is what I wanted to do. And then when I found service design, it's like, ah, actually, I was a service designer maybe all along of how I was thinking, but I just didn't have a name for it. And I think there's so many professions where we don't have a name for it. Cool. Uh, thanks for sharing. That's always interesting uh, to learn about the stories. 
Interesting. Now, I don't think anybody else has mentioned Singapore uh, as a prime example. Uh, Lily, we have a lightning round to uh, see who you are as a person next to the professional. Short questions, uh, hopefully also short answers. Just the first thing that comes to your mind. Are you ready? Yeah, sure. What's the movie that you could watch for the rest of your life? Perfect days. The most important quality in a friend is place in your fridge. Hmm. The best part of my day is uh, when? My morning cup. <laughs> and fifth and final one, uh, you're on fire. Our world needs more? Mm, caring people. Awesome. Thank you. That was a uh, lightning round the way it is designed to go. Um, yeah, very Italian also. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very Dutch as well, by the way, but uh, um, thanks. We had a pre-conversation conversation and we talked a little bit about the wish you have for our community, our society, mm -hmm. maybe our world. And one thing you mentioned there was that you wish we would take a step back. Could you elaborate a little bit about on that? So in my work, I really focus around the question, how can we prepare and adapt to the planetary crisis, which feels very huge and enormous. And I think it also keeps many of us a bit trapped in inaction and procrastination and often also denial. And along this journey of trying to understand what that means and what we can do, um, one of the things that I found is probably the most impactful is actually stepping out of our hamster wheel. I find that we're all just because the way this, the system or this world is designed, um, incredibly busy, um, working, paying the bills, um, taking care of the people in our lives so that there is very little space of reimagining what this world could look like. And what I found is the people that I met that have the more transformative ideas and actually are working on this have all had the privilege or the time or the courage to just take a back, step back and to break out of the kind of everyday grind um, to really rethink and understand where, where is this problem coming from? What is the symptom and what's actually the root cause behind it? If I'm not mistaken, you also got the opportunity to take a step back. Is that right? Yeah. So I think I, I had to some extent the, the, the privilege and also a bit of the courage. So I think I took two steps back. I think one was actually during the pandemic when I, uh, at the time I worked for, for Ideon, like a design consultancy, which is now Frog in, in London. And it suddenly didn't matter anymore from where I was working from. So I decided why not exchange the gray skies of London with sun and pizza in Italy and uh, moved back here. And um, at that time I already started and had started prototyping freelancer freelancing at the site. So I had a four day week and once a week I could actually focus on projects that really were um, interesting to me. And so that was mostly teaching service design for social impact organization. And suddenly as I couldn't work anymore, I decided to just go full time into freelancing. And that was um, very, very daunting. I remember specifically the first months, um, even if I had prepared, even if I had already clients and so on, I really felt a lot of existential fear because suddenly you're actually, you are your own boss and the choice feels overwhelming. And then for the first two years, I essentially decided a bit to take on what projects were coming along my way were, were also aligned with my interest. And I think there was also very busy time. So I was lucky to get more work than I could take on. But I think an important aspect that I did was also defining what was enough for me. So, and also taking the time to really explore what would be my space in climate and sustainability, because saying I want to work in climate is like saying I want to do sports. Yeah. What type of sports do you want to do? Is it running, yoga, and so on? And I found my spot in climate adaptation and climate resilience. 
And then I thought, it's nice to do this at the side, but actually I would love to really focus on this full time. And so what I decided is that when I reached my revenue goal, I would just take back um, and stop and take a sabbatical from client work. And I thought I would actually sort everything out in three months. And then it actually took longer. But I think that really kicked me off on a journey. And stepping out was incredibly hard. Um, Just to give you a sense, I think there was a time in which my whole body ached. And I, I really didn't understand why. And then speaking and really understanding was essentially like I didn't have anything to hold on to. So I, my body was just grappling onto itself because there was no way of knowing and just the level of uncertainty and our body and our mind just hates uncertainty, even if there's a lot to unpack here and we'll do that yeah. step by step. So client adaptation, that's going to be probably the focus for the rest of our chat. But I also want to talk a little bit about your entrepreneurship journey. You very quickly stepped over the fact that at some point you had to step out or you weren't able to work anymore. Like, can you take us back to that moment? Like, what? what, how did the transition go? I think generally for me, it was a gradual transition. So I remember, I think I, for a long time, I always wanted to build something. I think as a kid, I loved building tree houses. And then I think I'm just now like, no, it was building services. But like probably many service designers, I ended up working, service design can either know, improve an existing service, or you can create something from scratch. And I really was fascinated by creating things from scratch because there was like, really, you need to come up with something new and really understand needs. And so I was doing basically working on venture projects for um, idea and, and a lot of those venture projects, but even as a freelancer afterwards for kind of fintech unicorns, they to some extent take an incredibly long time. They end up in the drawer, they internal reorgs. So I was like, okay, this is very frustrating. You spent months building something and it doesn't go anywhere. Um, am I actually able to do this or not? Uh, can I actually, yeah, uh, is this actually a job or do I just say I'm, I'm doing this? And so I think I was like, also for me, kind of proving myself and seeing, can I can I actually make that happen? And what would that look like? And I think it's what I now can see, it's very different um, building a company for somebody else than building your own company. Because when you are your business, it really is so much tied to your identity and who you are. And um, when you have been working for a long time for organizations, what makes you successful is your ability to fit in, to adapt. And what actually makes you successful as an entrepreneur, even solopreneur, is actually the ability to stand out. But to stand out, you really need to know yourself. You need to know what is important to you and to find that because only that way you can really transfer passion and excitement and, yeah, make make sure that actually people want to work with you i'm really curious so you you have a background working for a well-known agency um and then at some point you leave that agency to start your own journey your own adventure you mentioned that it's important to know who you are or to figure that out like how did that how did the first two or three years go for you in your own business how did you did you from the first day know that you wanted to move towards sustainability and client uh, climate adaptation or was this also a gradu- something that gradually evolved i think it gradually evolved because i think what i did is when i moved um i was working for liftwork and then i moved to um i did the unfrog um, I actually, at the first interview, I asked them to have a four-day week and said I would do, just do a four-day week because I wanted to um, yeah, experiment with my own thing. So for two years, I essentially took this pay cut to have the time to um, deliver mostly trainings and workshops because that was actually something that I could fit well in. And I was delivering them mostly in Italy. So there was no kind of conflict of interest. And I could actually even um, make the business case for this choice because when you need to teach something, you need to be, get really good at clarifying it and simplifying the concept. So I just was able to also convince them that this was good for the company. They pay me less, but I actually become a better designer in the process. 
And um, over the time, actually, that work built up. And then I had initially, there was a bit of um, a phase where I got together with my old boss, who was an HR consultant, and she was building a boutique consultancy. And she said, you want to join as a partner? And I said, yes. And when we were trying to figure out, but actually I realized in the end that I, there wasn't much space for design or actually for sustainability. And so we actually agreed that I would just help out on specific projects and, and then just, um, yeah, we would go separate ways. Um, and that was a good decision because I think probably I would have accepted it because I thought I needed something. Um, and it wasn't the right thing. So that was really lucky. And I hadn't done all the work that I would now advise to people really kind of think, understand your values or what's important or what's your must have. I just thought I needed to get the first thing that comes my way. And then uh, what happened afterwards, I got different projects that were like more long term engagements, like six weeks or one even over a year. And that's what I would potentially call a bit more reactive freelancing, where you just kind of get things that come your way, you evaluate, is this the right thing or not? And But at the same time, I already started um, experimenting things around sustainability. So what I learned over time that really, and this is maybe also a very practical tip, is about learning in the open. So as I was learning things from around sustainability in general, I already translated that into how could I potentially teach or share that? So sharing it, what I learned, inviting other people. And so what I designed was essentially a mini course for small and medium sized companies in Italy, because I thought that's relatively easy. That would combine our service design thinking. And where do you start with sustainability and testing that out? And so that was a great way to learning about it. But somehow it never really felt right to me um, because I could see how those companies had those big aspirations, but then when we needed to actually implement things, we would go back and back, backtrack, and it was just like a tiny bit better. And I was like, that doesn't really make sense. And at the same time, the more I learned around the climate crisis or the planetary crisis, the more I understood its extent. And the more also I found fascinating the fact that everybody was so concentrated and had for me, what felt a bit like this belief, ah, if we are doing things better or less bad, we will be fine. And I was like, no, but if I look at this data, if even if we would stop now and be like net zero, what we call it, um, we would still deal with the impacts of, of this for decades. And why is nobody talking about that? And why what is this topic of climate adaptation and how is this different? And so if you think most traditional sustainability initiatives all focus on mitigation, which is essentially really addressing the root cause of the problem of like, how can we reduce emission? How can we make sure really like this is absorbed? And very little, I mean, rightfully so in the global north is about climate adaptation. How do we prepare and adapt and reduce the risk and vulnerability that come from it? And whilst adaptation is a kind of number one priority in the global south, it's not in the global north, but it is, and it is here. And I can also see how things have shifted very quickly because um, over two years ago, people were talking to me as I feel very sorry for the next generations. And now people are realizing this is here, this is happening right now. But what I also found personally is I thought I would come in as a designer being ready to design responses to this. And then I realized that actually people were a step back. They didn't even know what climate adaptation and resilience is. So I needed, again, to kind of raise awareness, educate, talk about it. And then I realized that there is even a step before that, that I need people to help get through. And that is actually this barrier emotional barrier of recognizing and acknowledging that the world that we have no longer exists and the future that we've imagined won't be there. Mm. And that's so painful that people just, yeah, struggle with it. That's something that we shouldn't uh, skip over and take for granted when you say the world that we imagine isn't going to be here. What is the world that we imagine that's not going to be here? So I think what we often do, and we just take the past and use our 
experience of the past to project into the future. So if you think or the images that we have, and I think the world that we also have had for a long time was a world of stability relatively. And again, when we use sometimes even data or AI, we just use data from the past to predict the future. But what we actually have done, climate change is just one of the, the elements, but there are so many other kind of aspects that feed into this is that we have created just a lot of instability and uncertainty. And, and that actually means it's incredibly also hard to predict the future. And so quite a lot of people, what we tend to do sometimes naturally is going into doomerism and ac- apocalyptic thinking. But I believe that's actually just a new version of climate denial or generally. Um, and because we, we, we have just a bit of a, like a crisis of imagination And what I find fascinating as I went on this learning journey is actually rediscovering probably different worldviews. Sometimes those worldviews come from indigenous people to like reimagine what the future could look like. And there is also this wonderful book called Everyday Utopia, um, which essentially talks about millennials of experiments of how people have envisioned different ways of living, working and doing. And it's then when you read that, then you can start imagining like other versions that potentially work well in the world of volatility, because I think that we could also learn a lot from the global south, because there have been countries who have been constantly um, volatile and people have still learned how to adapt and navigate. them. So from the worldviews that you've seen and the things that inspire you at the moment and maybe even give you hope, I don't know if you have hope for the future, but... What have you seen? Uh, what are those stories and examples that we can maybe take inspiration from? One of the things that really struck, struck me to some extent is, for example, our society really is all driven about growth and accumulating wealth. And if you even know the latest statistics that we see is like, no, how many few rich people like, own the same amount as like billions of poor people. And it's like the aspiration is to gain and accumulate wealth, like a dragon that sits on on the big kind of treasure. And there was this article, and I'm happy to share the link. Um, It talks about how actually Maslow, um, before he created the Pyramid of Needs, he actually spent some time with the Blackfoot tribe. And in that Blackfoot tribe, one of the things that he observed that people who had status were actually generous. And they would have this ritual where they would go in and actually give away. Because if you had a lot, then what makes you a rich person is the ability to be generous and give it away. And that is exactly the opposite of what we know. We kind of aspire to what if actually being rich would mean that you and having status would mean like being a generous person rather than a, a you know, kind of serial accumulator. And so that's one of the examples I could mention. I can, I'm trying to imagine what is the typical response that you hear when you share this story? And I'm, you know, we're going to create and generalize uh, here, but this isn't the common narrative yet, right? So what's the response that you get? The response usually when I do workshops or presentations like, ah, I've never thought about that. Um, It's just, ah, it's not something that is so common. One of the things that makes me think generally, uh, so I grew up in in a remote mountain farm in South Tyrol in the Italian Alps. And um, I lived in this house. My, My dad had nine, there were nine siblings. Um, my grandma, she kind of sur- is a, like survived, not the concentration camp, but something in between. She was like a political prisoner. So they were like, she was incredibly poor. My granddad had cancer. So they had like nine children plus two adoptive. They were incredibly like, sometimes you hear stories where they didn't have like, no, their Christmas gift was um, one loaf of bread. That was the thing. And that's just one generation back. But what I observe in my family is that there is 
because of that scarcity, there is such a connection and everybody helps each other out. Everybody trades their skills, what they have. And to this day, we would come multiple times a year together to celebrate and do a barbecue or whatever. And it's like 38 people or something. So sometimes I believe like a lot of people, when they say, I've never thought about that, actually, there is plenty of stories where probably we take inspiration. We also believe that we need to give up so much, but I don't believe that. I actually believe that um, um, George Monbois says it really nicely. Um, he says we need to move from this private luxury and public necessity where everybody's trying to accumulate private luxury and kind of education, healthcare is actually taking little to the opposite, to having private necessity and public luxury. So imagine if um, if we'd had wonderful schools and wonderful healthcare and we would relatively have a simple life and not so much. And I think maybe also during the pandemic for a year, I lived with one suitcase and uh, very minimally, I understood also, okay, this is totally possible. We need very little um, and it doesn't impact us as much. One might say that is a pretty socialist view of society and maybe um utopia or is it even something that uh we should aspire to what do you say to those kind of i, I don't know if it's critics but to those worldviews I think it's often we have this no kind of typical element of like either or thinking it's also not kind of the no, one or the other, or it's like capitalism or socialism, like both things are, are maybe no to some extreme. It's really understanding what are the elements, how could we design? But the thing is, what I believe is, um, I believe in that we actually have more power to create things um, and to design and use that. And also other criticists, I generally think that it, Currently, I don't know if what's your experience, Mark, but I have so many conversations with so many people and so many really feel uncomfortable um, and uncomfortable in different ways. They just kind of experience, no, our world has worked really well for us, specifically in the global north, because it has been built, but it has come to, to a level where actually it comes back to us and it also impacts so the cost of living crisis and so on. So I, I believe, and the idea that, no, you can have endless growth on a planet with limited resources that can work for a bit, but not forever. So I also, there is no, I think, one perfect solution generally. I think it's about, can we question things and can we create things in, in a better way? Because we created this and so we can also create a new version. You mentioned that our climate crisis or whatever label you want to stick to it is a symptom and i think i would agree with that how would you or what have you found what is your best assumption around the root cause so it's so from all the podcasts that i was listening to all the readings all the things that i that i did so there is one key element around I think our productivity is really around this growth. But when you go back and back, back, back in time, then one of the things that really happened is a bit like it's a connection issue and connection probably more like a crisis of connection. And what, what it does mean, it's a bit like a connection that we have with ourselves, our nature and others. So if you think in many, many cultures, there is a concept similar to Ubuntu, so I am because we are. So there is just this acknowledgement that everything is interconnected and connected. And if I would now, I'm, I'm probably butchering a lot of readings and a lot of scientists and they can explain it better. But if I would put it in like incredibly simple terms and give concrete examples, it's like, so when we had this nomadic lifestyle, we would just move around and live off what we would need right there. There was not so much surplus because we couldn't carry it around with us. And then we started to settle. And the mo moment we settled, we actually could have a surplus and so on. And also we could be more people. And so suddenly we started to know probably how we organize and hierarchy started to emerge. And so sometimes some say that actually 
patriarchy um, was born dead, that actually, no, men are more important than women. And so you start actually understanding, like making a little bit of difference. And then maybe later on in history, you had colonialism. And in the upstream podcast series, you find a lot of episodes and many really kind of point this out, is we just started thinking that I'm separate from you and I'm different to you. So I'm different to any, any living being on this world and I'm better as a human or I stand above you. And the same thing for no white supremacy and people of color, like we are better. And so that by saying we are separate and probably dehumanizing or we know what we could call dehumanizing or kind of not connecting, we could start this extractive behavior in which you just take and not give back. And so by just extracting um, and not giving back, you create a bit of, yeah, what we now then late decades later have as more like climate crisis, planetary crisis and so on. And essentially a connection crisis. Yeah. And uh, so many say, yes, the no one, um, if you think of like the, sustain, like the sustainable inner development goals, like even working on yourself. Um, and then also, yeah, how you work it with connect with nature, but also connect with others. And what I find fascinating around this is no, then actually what we design becomes different as a designer. So we need to design relations. We need to design connection. Um, how does that look like? And so like the material of design changes. It's less about screens sometimes, but more. Again, about- so much to unpack here. One of the things that I'm curious to hear your perspective on is this is, these are habits and systems and rituals that we've um, learned over, well, not decades, uh, centuries. Uh, They are pretty ingrained in our society. If it's going to take us another few thousand years to reverse this, then we might have some issues. What makes you confident that we are able to shift this again and find more connection with ourselves together and with nature? I'm not confident that we can do it, but I think what I like to think about is if I do something, if I how no, if this is my life, I get one life, how I'm going to spend this? How can I make it actually meaningful? And so do I actually use it to serve? Um, As Daniel Machtenschmerger says, it's like, no, do I serve it to preserve or add beauty to life um, and to conserve it? Or do I actually just contribute in a different way? Mm. And many of us don't maybe have the privilege in the time or can have that choice. But if I have a choice, then I feel a sense of responsibility and obligation to actually do something that would, no, contribute even more positively to this world. I don't know if I if I will succeed, but at least I try it. And I think s- some say, or what really stuck me, you know, if I don't, for example, have children, but I think, you no, know, if my niece and my nephew in a few years back said, what have you done when you know you we could change things? And I could say, I've done nothing, or at least I have tried, then um, I think that is already a big thing or, uh, or what I can live. I think there is always, I also think, Utopia in itself doesn't, I was very kind of skeptical of that term or of that utopian thinking uh, for a long time because I really like, I'm much more a realist. I'm a very pragmatic person. So what can I do? But there in this, the author of Everyday Utopia, she essentially talks about when it comes to the past, we usually have a muscle and that we train and that is our collective memory. So why do we talk so much about certain things that happen in the history so that we don't forget and that we don't repeat? And she says, when it comes to the future, you actually, the same muscle that you need to train is hope and this optimism and the fact that you actually try to make things better. And somebody describes it as like, you're trying to no, kind of move three steps ahead. And then what will happen, it actually moves further away. So you will never reach it. But the fact that you saw it, you already tried and you made those three steps. And those three steps are the difference that allowed us to actually get to some extent and 
No, the world is not totally worse. It's also better on many aspects. And I think both elements can be true. And probably my theory of change personally is, is that we knew about the climate crisis for 50 years and we have done very little. And maybe things need to break down a little bit to actually open up a window of opportunity to build things back. But when we are building them back, let's not build them back with the same thinking that we use to create them. What, what could be actually a different way of thinking? And this practice basically in adaptation called transpor- transformative adaptation. So I feel I'm currently on this learning journey of what would that look like, of how when things are breaking down or How can we actually build things in a different way? Do you feel that things are breaking down in a different way than that than they have been over the last 50 years? Because as you rightfully say, we already knew quite a while about the climate issues, changes, uh, and haven't done a lot. Do you feel it's different right now or what has shifted? So this is not me. It's probably like other people who have studied this much, much longer than me. So if I think a bit, Alex Steffen, what they say, and then there is also another podcast. He said, no, there is. If you had taken time, no, the time before, you actually could have done gradual change and adaptation. But the problem is we haven't done anything. So the time we have and what we need to do now is much more radical than it would have been 30 years ago. And so that actually kind of puts us in a kind of completely different design challenge than we had 30 years ago. And then some call this also, I think, the elements of it, it's called technically like a catabolic collapse. Think of it as like, no, some steps. And you can see it already what we had so far. We had the pandemic. Maybe we have, didn't have a pandemic for a long time. So that is the step. And that kind of changes quite a lot of things. So the fact that I'm now sitting in Verona, Italy, and I could suddenly work from wherever, um, that hasn't been possible before. So you have some elements that happen that do this. And then you might go a bit like gradually, and then you have other forms that are transforming. But I think it's also that climate change is not linear. Um, and so it's not getting like a little bit worse every time. Um, I think already we could see it from data around the last year. But I think some say, yeah, um, we just no, don't know. We can't say the time. But I think what is coming is very radical change. <laughs> so, um, and it's scary. And, and that's totally like true and right. And I think... Um, Um, hard for us and I think that's also why we need to do much more things together because one person alone can't really solve this and we need many different responses and that's a a great leeway into discussing a little bit and learning more about your IMA collective because there you are bringing an interesting group of people together to do things together could you share a little bit about that so One of the things that happened is, as I decided a bit to focus on climate resilience, what what I would do as a typical designer, you say, okay, let me then do some research. And I started talking with my clients around that maybe had a certain design maturity around, okay, um, what about climate adaptation and resilience? So like, why why should we care about this? What's this? And then when I spoke to organizations in uh, the climate adaptation space and climate resilience, they're like, what's design beyond thing? how things look? And so it's like, okay, this is a tricky spot. I need to do a lot of awareness raising on both sides in different ways. But what I found is that both were asking questions like, how can I, se- how, how can I prepare myself for the future? Mm. And, and so I've realized that probably often people don't want to change things on an organizational level if they don't understand what it means at the personal level. Mm. And mm. so I started looking into what can we do at in an individual level to become more resilient and adaptable for this future. And so if you think about where we live, our finances, our relationships, our community, our homes, um, one of the elements that came out clearly was that how you make a living impacts most of them. And that actually working for yourself would be one of the most resilient options because you get to choose when, how, and where you're working from and what you're doing. And I found that very fascinating because you could see like 
um, this is perceived as one of the most uncertain options. Exactly. Of, yeah. yeah. So why 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 what, what makes it more resilient and wh why why are we perceiving it as so uncertain? And I thought, okay, one I can understand it. Nobody actually teaches you how to build a small and nimble business because education, the traditional education system prepares you to be an employee. And then you have accelerators and incubators that want to build the next unicorn. But there is actually very little for people who sa say, I want to be independent and um, maybe not hire people because that feels like deciding to have kids, additional responsibility. And we have now new ways of actually getting help and using technology. And then I found that the other element is that if you do it alone, you're really like a single tree exposed to all the elements and the winds and the ups and downs of the market. But what if you actually would do it together with others and you would like the trees usually through their roots, pass nutrients and communicate and share information. And so what, what would that mean if you do it for yeah, freelancers or solopreneurs or people building small businesses. And I thought, okay, then I need to do this, but rather to do it for any type of freelancer, I just want to do it for people who truly want to work in climate and social impact. And so bringing that together, and that was a bit how, how I started in a collective. How would you describe the, the current situation of the collective? Uh, to give you a bit of context, so in February last year, I just launched a website. And then um, at a certain point in April, I started building a bit um, a newsletter and sharing opportunities, freelance opportunities on a biweekly basis at the beginning and then a weekly. So I started to grow like an audience and now have a mailing list of like 1,700 people. And then it took me quite a long time to understand how could I bring people together and where and how I bring them together and what's really. And I, I found it actually fascinating because it took me much longer to build the community that is currently run and circle. But I realized that it's easy to build something for somebody else. It's hard to build something when you build something that is really core to your identity and the thing that you care. And now I have um, th around 13 founding members that um, are from US and Europe mostly. Um, but it's really nice how, how people came and how probably by getting much clearer of like what type of people this is for and how it works and what is really at the core of it. Um, it really attracted the wonderful group of people. Um, and it's a bit like a, a community garden where everybody has their allotment, their business that they're cultivating, but we just do that in a shared space and we share information, share opportunities, collaborate and help each other out. And then at the other hand, I there is also one part where it's like helping people who start out and how do you and uh everybody in the community has an affiliation with climate adaptation sustainability correct yeah it's mostly it can go no climate or like social impact so for example people are like charity consultants uh, others work more like in climate adaptation others are like more product designers and want to do that in for example more for climate climate tech it really varies interesting how our conversation is going from entrepreneurship towards saving the planet towards entrepreneurship again uh, you mentioned something that uh, about the fact that it's hard to build something for yourself or that it's harder th than doing it for a client what would you say was the biggest challenge that you encountered i think generally if you build something on your own it's like you're constantly like faced with your own limitations um, of and you really need to become that person as well as um i think the other thing if you want to build in a different logic um or to kind of how can you make this regenerative what would be practices so i constantly also think okay how can i help people help make a living thanks to Emma Collective, also through Emma Collective and and setting constantly thinking ahead and how that could look like as an ecosystem, but then also taking just the first step and doing it and putting yourself out there. And I think then suddenly also when I was doing consulting, I was just probably needing to build 
oh, a few relationships with people and nurturing them. But when I wanted to build in, I suddenly knew that I needed to become very vis visible. And being visible can be very scary. And it took me a time to become good at being visible, um, start writing and really sharing the thoughts and things behind. So I feel, and also really putting myself in there and what, what is there and why why is this because otherwise i think if you probably mark you know it if you if you run a community or something that's actually happening all the time and if i wouldn't have probably taken the time to listen or even become the right person for this um then i would be probably be burned out very quickly and so this is actually a way of building it more slowly and also at a sustainable pace and i think i also did it I did that, but I keep also my consultancy practice. So in the name of resilience, I keep my eggs in two different baskets. But doing two things is also how do you balance the two? How do you do, like focus your energy? And also I picked a really hard niche in the climate space, which is climate adaptation. So also just focusing and doing 100% of my work in there and getting that. I've just done two hard things in a year um, that, yeah take their energy and their time is there something in your um uh what is it in your character that makes you pick two hard things <laughs> to pursue hard yes. things yes i really like challenging things i also somebody somebody said it maybe it's because you grew up in the mountains and in the mountains whatever you want to do you actually need to climb up like it's not that you were i didn't grow up at the seaside in which i just go out and lie on the sand on the beach and just relax uh, usually everything that you do requires a certain type of effort and i like a good challenge um and so i think that and i probably have the determination and the confidence that i will make it the only variable that i can control is the time how long this will take me and probably it's like just about how can I stay in the game and do the things and then sooner or later it will I will figure it out or we will figure it out and I think no somebody said it's only a failure if you stop trying interesting uh there's definitely something in your DNA about that and uh the metaphor of climbing the mountain uh you can probably even with the ventures that you are doing right now you can already see the top um you don't know the exact route to the top and when you'll get there, but as long as you keep moving in the right direction, then at some point, uh, and even like you said uh, earlier in the conversation, maybe it's not even about making it to the top. Maybe it's about being on the journey and then uh, to your last uh, example, hoping that a few people hop on for the journey as well, that it's not a lonely climb. Yeah, exactly. I think the mantra that I developed for building Emma and that I've put everywhere is with joy and patience, Emma will become what is meant to be. And for me, that was it's really about enjoying, um, having the patience that I usually am impatient, but also making it fun and then just trusting the process and letting go also part of it. Yeah. And then we can get into a completely different uh, conversation about uh, happiness, joy, productivity, uh, what efficiency means. Um, I was listening to a different podcast uh, of Carl Newport in a conversation with Ali Abdal where, where the new notion sort of is that the ultimate productivity hack is just doing work that you enjoy and that is fun. So imagine that work would be fun as in trying to cram as much things into a short amount of time anyway but that's a completely different topic uh different podcast before we um start to wrap up i'm i'm really curious in the journey uh that you've uh been on well almost for a year what's the thing that you're most proud of so far i think just going doing it and continuing doing doing the thing and probably I think when I started out, people were just saying to me, you can't, if you don't have money in relationships, you can't build a startup, or you can't build a business. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to try it out anyway. Um, if I don't, um, yeah, if I can't, I don't, I just have learned so much in this year. I learned how to write. I learned how to show up. I learned how to um, 
figure out like one problem after the other and solve it. And somebody just like, yeah, and like entrepreneurship is really constant problem solving. And there are a it's few not moments, just it's it's yeah. it's life in general. <laughs> yes. Well, so uh, uh, maybe uh, related to this, what would be the advice that, knowing what you know right now, you would have given yourself a year back? Actually, that being in the the messy phase when everything is foggy and you don't know exactly where you're going, that is the most uncomfortable phase. And to just stick through that phase and that every time you are, to reframe it as actually that's an incubation period. What I noticed when things were really, really hard and I didn't have no clue, um, suddenly after that, there was a breakthrough or there was a moment of clarity. And so kind of really when people sometimes met me, it's like, oh, okay, wow, I, uh, I can see how, how everything then clicks and somehow it comes. And what I also did sometimes more very intuitively. And I think really learning to listen to your intuition. If something doesn't feel right and is not aligned, just wait. Uh, wait, don't push it, don't force yourself. Uh, because it means that the better solution is along the way and you just need to give it the time to emerge um, through whatever helps you make, make it emerge. Uh, for me, that's spending time in nature and walking and doing sports. For others, that might be different being under the shower, but maybe not do too many showers. <laughs> mm. So interesting that um, these these life lessons uh, and going through these uncomfortable situations at some point when you've gone through a few of them, you'll actually, at least that's for me, you'll actually start seeking them out because when things start to get foggy and uncomfortable and you don't know which direction you'll be heading into, you know that you're doing something that you haven't done before. Something interesting is going on. And I I enjoy those moments nowadays because I know something interesting is going to happen. It is still uncomfortable, but um, yeah, I, 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 I am able right now to reframe that in my own head as in, yeah, it feels uncomfortable, but a cold shower also feels uncomfortable and doing 100 push-ups also feels uncomfortable, but you know, um, the end result is usually worth it. Yeah, I think in, if you if people decide to work on climate and social impact, then actually you have even double or triple uncomfortableness because one, the thing is uncomfortable for you, but you actually make people uncomfortable. Um, like my work actually makes people feel uncomfortable. And so how do I hold space for that? How do I actually help them through? Because what I essentially either through him, but also climate adaptation, it questions how people live and what their choices are. And so that's already very uncomfortable. How, um, how can people help? So we're sitting here together, listening to your inspiring story. Let's say we also want to either join you on this journey or embark on our own journey. What's, where can we start? If it's about, yeah, where you, you start, I think, the super concrete thing that I got recently from um, um, uh, Brad James, Ryan James, he said, actually, think about the thing you are most grateful for. And that's usually a great starting point because for to understand what you should focus on, if you ever look out what, what's the thing that you actually should concentrate on. And then if it's about helping me or i think it's just spreading the word around in my collective learning about it um that would be super helpful because as you know bootstrapping something it's usually no there is no money i don't spend anything in marketing it's mostly people talking about um in my collective and sharing what i'm doing so yeah well at the link in the show notes um Thanks. Uh, this was uh, a very interesting conversation that took us into different avenues, but it's, um, I like having these conversations, which are sort of multifaceted because that's who we are as people like how part of us is being uh, a parent. Part of us is being an entrepreneur. Part of us is doing something to save our planet. And that's just the way it is. And I think it's good to. Um, appreciate that holistic nature 
and, and uh, have those conversations. So thank you for having a holistic conversation with us today. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a really journey. I think I find it fascinating how everybody, you know, once you go on this journey of exploration, once you take that time, as we started off, you no, know, if people take a break, it just leads you into different avenues. So I think probably this conversation is just an example of what's been the journey over the last, yeah, one, two years. And then two years down the road, we'll have a completely different conversation yeah. because you'll have experienced different things and hopefully many have joined you on this journey. Uh, so Lily, thanks again for coming on and uh, all the links will be in the show notes. Thanks Mark for having me. Time for a few final thoughts. I love how our conversation wove together entrepreneurship, community and personal growth. Proof that if Lily's story resonates with you, please reach out to continue the conversation. For me, this episode is a reminder that the future demands faith, hope and embracing the unknown. But most importantly, I think it inspires me to think about which stories will I tell the next generation about how I made a difference. If you found this episode valuable, here is how you can help. Click the like button if you haven't done so already. It's not about the vanity metrics. It's about letting me know that we're exploring topics that resonate with you. This helps me to keep bringing you the content that you want. Before we go, I want to take a moment to acknowledge something important. By being here today, you've chosen to learn and grow. That's something to celebrate. So on behalf of everyone who will benefit from your work, thank you. Thank you for taking the time and your commitment to making a positive impact. My name is Mark Fontaine and I look forward to having you with us again for a new conversation on the Service Design Show. Take care and see you soon.